Good evening, everybody. As you probably realize by now, today is Youth Day. So I hope all you young people out there have had a lot of fun and taken time to spend time with the young people in your lives. Thank you, young people, that we got to have a day off. And uh, earlier today, we were able to come into the church and to spend time praying for the young people of our country. Let's open this evening's devotion with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you that we can meet with you tonight. Hear your word and your thoughts and learn as you teach us through the Holy Spirit, through the devotion this evening. So we commit this time that we spend with you into your hands and ask that you'd make it a fruitful one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right, so, youth. Most of us have left that behind a long time ago. However, when you think back on your youth, doesn't it put a smile on your face? Don't you remember all those fun things that you did making camps in the bush? There was no TV, so you entertained yourself with games, evenings at your friends. I remember the rule was go out and play, but you had to be home by the time the streetlights came on. So I remember racing the streetlights home on many an evening. And life was just without COVID and without the stress of cell phones and instant internet to keep us busy. It, it was just a lot of fun. I loved my youth years, and I'm sure you all did as well. Hopefully during our youth years, we took time to learn about how to be adults, by observing the adults in our lives, hopefully. And let's have a look and see what the Bible says about young people. I was sharing just, yeah, just before lockdown, um, with a group of young people, and somewhere in the conversation, I got to talk about um, a postage stamp. Because we wrote letters to each other back in those days. We didn't send SMSs or WhatsApps or emails. You wrote a letter and you waited anywhere up to 10 days to get a reply. Um, and those letters were so personal. And I spoke about the postage stamps and collecting postage stamps. And one of the youngsters put their hand up and said, what is a postage stamp? What is a stamp? And I suddenly realized how much things have changed because they honestly didn't know about a stamp. They'd never seen a stamp. Well, I did get to explain what a stamp was, but as I say, it was then that I realized how much things have changed. He has a word of good news. God's word never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And let's go to God's word and have a look at what God's word says about young people. My first reading this evening is from Proverbs, um, chapter 22, and verse 6. Perhaps I should uh, not pretend to be young anymore and put on something that us older people need when our arms get too short. Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 6 says, Train a child in the way he should go, and when... He is old. He will not turn from it. God is making it clear here that if we fill a child with the teaching of the Word of God and the ways of God, they'll never turn away from it. Our next scripture is found in Mark. And this is what it says. It's Mark chapter 10, verse 13 to 16. And it reads like this. The little children and Jesus. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Little children, let them come to me, for the kingdom of God belongs to the little children. 
And I'll tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it. Those are powerful words. The kingdom of God will not be entered unless you receive it like a little child. Let's go and have a look at Matthew chapter 18 verse 2 to 6. And it says this, He called a little child and had him stand among them, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes these little ones to believe, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. I mean, that is harsh. Jesus doesn't often say things that are that threatening and that harsh. So that tells me, number one, that he is super serious about the fact that little children must be allowed to come into the kingdom of God. That little children are the most important in the kingdom of God and that we should instruct them clearly in his ways. He also says that unless we have faith like a child, we will not enter the kingdom of God. And then the last verse that I want to read is Luke. And I'm reading from Luke chapter 2, verse 46 to 49. And it says this. After three days, they found him in a temple. And he was in the courts, sitting amongst the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? <coughs> yeah, that's the first thing that I want to speak about. The fact that Jesus, when his parents had gone to, um, it was like a, a referendum where they all had to go and register in their various provinces so that it was for taxes purposes. So it was very much like a referendum. And they traveled all the way and then they were on their way home and they traveled a whole day before they realized that Jesus, who was 12 years old at the time, was not with them. So they had to turn around and go back and look for him. So they traveled a day, they turned around, they traveled back a day, that's two days, and then they searched for him for a day. And it says, on the third day, they found him, and he was in the temple. And he says, where else would I be but in my father's house? And there he was, asking questions, giving answers, impressing the teachers of the law and of the scripture, and discussing various things with them in a very understanding and mature way. And... We should not be afraid to teach the truth of the Word of God to children because I think sometimes we underestimate children and we try and baby things down a bit for them. Yes, there is a time for babying things, but if you really want them to understand, we need to tell them the truth about God, the truth about Jesus, who He is and what He's done and how they should live and the consequences there, thereof if they don't because that is what we should do. Now, I looked for stories in the Bible, and there were a couple. There was David who killed Goliath, one or two other stories. But this one about Jesus in the temple stood out in my mind and impressed me that there was Jesus. Even as a young boy, he had 
the desire to be with his father in his father's house. But the story that I decided I'd like to take our lesson from tonight is the story where Jesus fed the 5,000. But although Jesus fed the 5,000, to me, the little boy in the story is the hero of the story. So Jesus had done a lot of miracles and a large crowd was following him. And he came to this hillside and he stopped and the people just gathered around in, in the flat area below the little copy that Jesus was standing on. And he looked at the disciples and he said, where are we going to find food to feed all of these people? Now if you read um, Bible history and if you read commentaries and things, they say that when they refer to Jesus feeding the 5,000, those 5,000 were adult men. That does not include the wives and the children. So who knows how many were there. They only counted men. Because you know that men were the most important back in that, in that time. So Jesus feeds these 5,000. And um, one of the disciples come to him and say to him, Jesus, all we can find is this little boy. He has five barley loaves and two small fish. And Jesus says, well, bring them to me. But allow me to interpret the story through the eyes of that little boy. Because that's truly where our lesson lies. So imagine being this little boy. You have been impressed with Jesus and the miracles he's doing. And everyone is like, wow, Jesus, Jesus, this guy's incredible. And so everybody's following him to see what he's going to do next, to see what he's going to say next. And the little boy has obviously said to his parents, um, I want to go and see what Jesus is up to today. And mom gave him these little loaves and these couple of fish and sent him on his way. Um, perhaps they didn't believe in Jesus. That's often the case. We drop our kids at church and we go off and have coffee and pick them up after Sunday school. And that's not what we heard the word saying. The word says we should instruct our children in the ways of the Lord. And anyway, however it happened, the little boy is in the crowd and now the disciples are going around and they're looking to see how they can feed this 5,000. And they come to the little boy and they say, uh, please can we have your, your food, your loaves and your fish. And I can imagine him going, uh, no, no, but this, my mommy gave this, this is my lunch. And then they say, no, Jesus wants it. Hang on a minute, Jesus wants my lunch? But it's only five body loaves and two small fish. Never mind, Jesus wants it. Okay, well, if it's for Jesus, you can take it. And I can just see this little kid going, well, Jesus did so many other miracles, and he's so amazing. I'll be quite happy to give him my little bit for whatever he wants it for. He didn't question why does he want it, what does he want to do with it. When he heard it was for Jesus, he just gave it and... They brought it to Jesus. And we know the rest of the story. Jesus feeds the 5,000. And then he sends the disciples. And he says to them, go and gather up the leftovers. None of this must be wasted. And they fill 12 baskets. Now, you might say, were they big baskets like a washing basket? Um, were they small baskets like a picnic basket? I don't know. But in those days, they grew wheat and they would harvest everything from the field. And I, I've seen pictures of those harvesting baskets which they would sling over their, their back and they were at least that round and this high. I mean, that's way more than five barley loaves and two fish to fill one of those baskets. And there were 12 of them left over afterwards. So, what can we learn from this story? First of all, The little boy might have been frightened because he was little and now these big disciples and remember they were mainly fishermen so they were big strapping oaks sun tanned, maybe scarred because they'd fought the nets and been cut rough looking men 
come to him and say, give us your lunch. And when he hears it for Jesus, he puts his faith in Jesus' hands. The little that he had, he puts his faith unquestionably in Jesus' hands. So lesson one, we need to have faith like a little child. And that child proves that he put his faith in Jesus, unquestionably. The second thing that we learn is that because the little boy had obviously seen Jesus doing miracles, when he heard Jesus was going to feed the 5,000 with his little lunch, he didn't doubt it. He might have thought, wow, that's going to be amazing to see. But he never doubted it at all. <clears throat> the third lesson we learn is, what if it was you and I? As adults, we see the five loaves and the two fish. And I'm pretty sure Jesus' disciples had these thoughts as well. And they went, you can feed 5,000 with that? Yeah, right. Because when they presented them to Jesus, they said, all we could find were these five loaves and two fish. They were like already downplaying how much they had. This is all we had. But remember, it doesn't matter how much you have, whatever you have, if you give it all, it is always enough for Jesus. So, we as adults often, to fi- often struggle to find the victory in situations because we allow our life experience to cloud what Jesus wants to do and to derail, to derail our faith. So practically we've been through situations in our life and then we are asked to use faith in a situation and all our life's experiences come back and like, oh, the similar situation that happened and then in that other similar situation, oh, it didn't go well there. And all of these thoughts come to us. And instead of going, yes, Jesus can do this, we go, what if, but you know, maybe he won't do it, maybe it won't be like that, it'll be like this. So do not allow your life's experience to derail what God wants to do in your life. Just have faith like that child that doesn't question. And that's the difference, I think, between adult faith and childlike faith. They haven't been through all the things as adults we've been through. So they they haven't had the experience that may have been negative or positive in whichever way to derail what they actually believe. Then, if we're going to believe, and I've said it a couple of times, like little children, how do little children believe? They trust 100% totally, unquestionably. Have you ever seen when your grandchild is standing up on a little platform or a wall, if you have a grandchild, if you haven't got a grandchild, you'll know that it happened with your children maybe, and the child says, Daddy, Daddy, catch me, or Grandpa, Grandpa, catch me. And before you can say, oh, be careful, or anything, they just leap, and you have no option but to catch them. That is the blind faith of a little child, because they trust 100%. This is my grandpa. This is my dad. They're going to catch me. And you do. And you've strengthened their faith. So next time, when you see them, get ready, because they are going to jump. And as we come in for a landing, I want to say that we all have the ability to believe. And when I say we all have the ability to believe, we all have the ability to believe without question. Now, I know you're going to probably laugh at me, but I'll prove it to you. Before ESCOM had the hiccups that it had, and before we had load shedding, did you ever stop and look at the light switch before you switched it on? You walk down the passage, you need to blow your nose, the tissues are in your bedroom, and you just walk through and flick the light switch on so that you can locate the tissues in the dark. Never once did you stop and go, ooh, maybe I should fetch matches and a candle. What if when I press this button, the light doesn't come on? No, you don't. You, that never entered your mind, ever. That faith is because time and time again, you've pressed that switch and the light has come on. It's the same as the tap. Time and time again, you turn the tap, 
And you never questioned, hey, tap, please give me water. You just knew water would come out. And that's how faith is built, by relying on Jesus and seeing him come through every single time. And the more you give to him and the more you rely on him, the more he is faithful and the more your faith will grow because you know that it's going to be like you ask him to. So how much have you given to the Lord in your life? How much have you trusted and exercised your faith? Because Jesus is like that light switch without Eskom's problems and load shedding. He will always come through for you because that's what he says. He says, I will always love you. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And you can ask anything in my name and I will do it in order to give the Father the glory. And we should be doing that. The more you give to Jesus, the more your faith grows. And the final point that I wanted to make is that the little boy had five barley loaves and two fish. And he had total, total faith. And gave it unquestionably to Jesus. So there it was. Five loaves, two fish given unquestionably to Jesus. What made the difference? We took Jesus and we add Jesus into the mix. Now we have five loaves, two fish, one little boy's unquestioning faith, and Jesus. Bam! You've got 12 baskets left over after 5,000 have been filled. And when you read that story, and you can go and read it in, in John chapter 6, uh, I'll tell you where, John chapter 6, verse 3 to verse 13. It says, when everyone had eaten their capacity as much as they needed to eat. So nobody was like, ah, is there any left over? They'd eaten and eaten. There were 12 baskets left over. So, what is our last and final lesson out of that? Is when you take your little bit and you give it unquestionably to Jesus, he will always give you more in return than you ever expected him to. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for young people and their blind faith. Thank you that we have all been young and all had the opportunity to learn those lessons. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have actually learned those lessons. And tonight we ask that you'd help us to bring them out of the cobwebs wherever they may be in our mind, so they can come to the forefront and we can begin all over again to believe like a child, without doubt, without question, knowing that you will take our little and multiply it many, many times. And through doing that, you will achieve your goal and purpose in our lives and through our lives. Father God, I pray a special blessing upon everyone this evening as their day of rest with their families and their young people come to an end and they spend a lovely evening together thinking about you and how allowing you to take control and put their faith in you will make a difference in the future and the days that lie ahead. So, Lord, we ask your blessing upon everybody who's watching this and every family represented by the folk that are watching this. We ask your blessing upon them all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.